we doing, Cross Point? So good to see each and every one of you. If you're a guest with us, thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. This is the only word I can come up with that you would spend time with us. Thank you so much for being here. We have tried really hard to make sure that everything at each of our campuses is exactly as it should be so that you would have an encounter, not with us, not even with one another, but with the God of the universe. And so that's our continued prayer, that as we get into the word, that you would experience the voice of God talking to you, that you would really feel his care and concern wrapped around you and your family and your situation. And so just know that that's on the table. That's our expectation and that's our prayer for this moment. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you make everyone around you feel welcome and do it by doing this. Look somebody in the eye and say, I'm better because you're here. Go ahead and tell them real quick. And if you pick somebody you already knew, turn around and do that to somebody else. Go ahead. That's right. I'm better because you're here. We are thankful that, uh, that you are a part of this gathering. We are on a series called Genuine. On the count of three, I'd like you to say that word. Ready? One, two, three. Genuine. It's a series that is on the, the book of First Peter, which is a book that was written by the Apostle Peter to the church that was really suffering. And I mean suffering in an incredible way, to the point of death. They were losing family members. They were losing everything they owned, all for standing up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in this, what we see are there are lessons for you and I. Now, we may or may not suffer to the same degree. And you and I may have varying levels of trials and difficulties that we're going through. But we are learning much from what Peter told this church on what God says about suffering. And everybody, everybody say everybody. Everybody has suffered, probably is suffering, but most definitely will suffer. That's just a part of life. Christianity, make sure we all hear this. Christianity is not an escape clause to suffering. Faith does not mean everything is great. Faith means you have the strength to make it through the junk in this life. Christianity is the answer to hurts that gives validity and reason when things are difficult. And so we're here to make sure that we understand that, that we are not trying to find some magic formula to make life easier. We're here to find the purpose of existence and why God made us, the very reason that we are here. One more time, look at somebody near you and say, you have a reason. Go ahead and tell them real quick. You have a reason. Now, before we get into this week's topic, I know you're thinking, man, we've been on uh, this for a month already. Can we quit talking about suffering? Well, almost. We're covering every chapter, and we're on chapter four or five in this series. And as we cover this chapter, before we talk about this specific point, I want to make a confession to you, and this confession isn't too hard to make. I'll tell you why in a moment. The confession is, I am a liar. And the reason that's not that hard is I know you're liars too. Everybody in here is. To one degree or another, we struggle with it. That's probably why God put it on his top 10 list, because he knew that would be an issue for many of us. Number nine, in case you're counting, do not lie. That's, that's one of God's rules. You know one of the places that we lie all the time? One of the places that even good godly people with the best of intentions lie? Is when somebody asks how you're doing. Somebody asks you how you're doing, what do you say? Fine or good. These are really two answers. Now, what kills me is I have actually walked with my wife, with staff members, with friends, with church members, with family, and, and we have just gone through a difficulty, just got some horrible news, just got some incredibly heavy weight put upon us. The phone rings, and you hear on the other end, and they say, fine. And you know they just lied. Why are we lying? I wish we were all like my dog, Apper. If, you, if, you don't, if you've never been introduced, we're Addis, so he's an apparatus. We think that's pretty funny. An apper is a dog with some character. We, we, you probably get mad at us if we, call, if we tell you what we call him. We call him stupid just because we can. Um, and he acts that way sometimes, but he's a lot smarter than he actually gives credit for. Let me tell you what happens. In the morning, apper loves to run outside. We, we keep him inside at night, and he loves to run outside. Unless it's really, really cold. And he's a smart enough dog that he doesn't want to go outside when it's really, really cold. So what he does is he pretends to stay asleep even when we talk to him. <laughs> he's laying there, and you know, normally a dog's not smart. If you call his name and he looks at you like this, you want to go outside? And he's like, no, not really. Apper just pretends. He doesn't even move. You call his name. I mean, you can just see the concentration. Don't move. <laughs> Don't open your eyes. You know the only problem with Apper is? His tail betrays him. I know he's awake because even though the rest of him is perfectly still, that tail starts going, wake, 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 wake. <laughs> Do you know what Christians need? 
We need a tail. We, we need a tail so that, so that when somebody asks you that question, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Wagga, 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 wagga. And that tail would betray us so that our friends and our family and those around us could look at us and go, that ain't the truth. I can see it all over you. There's something else going on. You know why we need that? Because everybody suffers. Everybody hurts. Everybody has needs. And we have this incredible framework of imaginary and illusory walls that try and project that everything's okay. Guess what? It's okay. Everything's not okay. It's okay to say that everything's not okay. And we in the body of Christ, we at this church at Crosspoint understand that we're studying this because suffering doesn't necessarily mean that you brought this on yourself. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus was asked about tragedy and trial. He says, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. You know what Jesus, Jesus said? Are you ready for this? Sometimes stuff just happens. That's what Jesus said. And in the middle of that nightmare, the next time, I'm going to challenge you, the next time somebody says, how are you doing? And you're not doing fine? To say, I hope you have 20 minutes and enough money for a cup of coffee. Because you asked the question, and I'm going to give you an answer. Can I get an amen in the house? This series is about becoming genuine, God making our faith genuine, God making us genuine, because it's hard to live this life, because suffering is a reality. But God is giving us bit by bit, one more time, one more lesson, one more help in knowing how to live in a difficult and hard place. Let me pray for us, then we're going to jump into this weekend's text. Father, I love you, and I thank you so much for the opportunity to teach. I admit before you and all those who are listening, I am inadequate, I'm unprepared, and I am am sinful. So I need you. I need you so much today. I pray that you would speak through this pastor. I pray that you would speak through this, this video broadcast. I pray that you would speak through this service. I pray that you would speak through the songs and the testimonies, uh, baptisms and the handshakes, the greetings, the ushers. God, would you not let a single person slip through the doors of this church this weekend without knowing that it's okay to be human and that you have given us everything we need for right where we are. God, I pray you would teach us a little bit about what it is to suffer as you would have us and to give us a grace to come through on the other side. For it is in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ that we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. All right, I need you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 or bring your notes out. It'll be on the slides and the screens. We've got every which way we can give it to you. We're on chapter 4 or 5 of 1 Peter and I'm going to pull back the curtain just a little bit and kind of let you know what goes on because I'm going to need you to make a change in your notes. Do you see in your notes where it says, when Christians suffer, right above the place where, do you see where it says that? That's no longer the title of this message. And let me tell you why. Uh, the way our organization works, I have to write my sermon weeks in advance, and then I work on it the week of, but Tuesday, the week of the message, I have to type up all the notes and get that little page that you have there. If there's ever a typo, it's all on me. I do all that, front and back, that's, that's my job, I get that there, and I have to have that turned in and uploaded by Tuesday morning so that all the other campuses, everybody across the Crosspoint Network can handle that. Every now and then, the Holy Spirit decides not to work on our schedule. Every now and then, God says, I got something else I want to say, and, and I've made a commitment that I would rather be embarrassed and tell you we got to change something in our notes than to defy what God really wants you to hear this weekend. Does that work for you guys? So you need to scratch off where it says uh, when Christians suffer or when, when you suffer. And by the way, that'll be next week. <laughs> that, that, that's the title you're going to get next week. This week, I would like you to write in the title for what, we, and the blanks are still the same, but it's going to be a finishing of a different sentence. It's this, if you're a Christian, dot, dot, dot. Now, this is a lesson for believers. This, these are for those who call themselves followers of Christ and how do we handle suffering. So, Each of these blanks is going to finish that statement, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian. Because I made a change, I need you all to say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, then this passage is about how you deal with suffering. Here we are in 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's look at uh, verse 12 uh, through a few. Here we go. Beloved, that's why it's to Christians, by the way. It's the beloved. 
That's the brethren. That's the, the sisterhood. That is the, the, those are those in the family. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something, were, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. rejoice. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is in the time of judgment, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, this is for those who are in the house. That would be us. I know the reason the majority of us are here at Cross Point this weekend is because we believe in Jesus Christ. So this message is to us. We obviously don't escape suffering because this message is to us. So if you're a Christian, everybody say, if you're a Christian, here are some things you need to know about suffering. The first fill in the blank is this. If you're a Christian, prepare yourself for trials. If you are a Christian, prepare yourself for trials. I know if you listen to too many televangelists, they tell you to prepare yourself for blessing, prepare yourself for glory, prepare yourself for abundance, and that's all good, and that comes sometimes, but let me tell you what this book just said. You need to prepare yourself for trials. That's just a reality in everyone's life. Go back to that first verse I read you. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, here's what Peter is telling the church. When bad stuff happens, don't let that shock you. You should be prepared. It's coming. Look at somebody near you and say, it's a coming, it's a coming. Go ahead and tell them. It's a coming, it's a coming. And he says, just don't be shocked by that. I, I, I love the language of this. I got to read it to you. This is the third time I've read it to you. This is how much I love it. Don't be surprised and then drop down as if something strange were happening to you. This is a problem in our culture today. I think people are shocked at stuff that they shouldn't be shocked at. I talk to parents all the time who tell me that their kid is in trouble and that they're having all these issues. It's all because of the children that they're running with. As soon as they get with those other kids, they act like animals. And I like to tell them in love, the kids aren't the problem. Your kid was already an animal looking for a herd. <laughs> Amen? You got this shock look on your face. Look at everybody in your family. They're all going, yeah, mm. When everybody around you sees it and you don't, you're the one common denominator. Can I get an amen in the house? You, you just quit being shocked. As a matter of fact, I, got, I, got, I made a list of the four things that we should stop being shocked over in our culture today. Four things we should stop being shocked over today. Number one, don't be shocked when you step on the scale. <laughs> it baffles me. People get on the scale, they're like, what? Dude, I saw what you ate yesterday. This is a consequence. Can I get an amen in the house? If you, if you shut off the TV, get off the couch, put down the microwave burrito and weigh, don't be shocked. Can I get an amen in the house? How about this one? Students, don't be shocked when you look at your grades. If you put more hours on YouTube than you do a book, that's what you're going to get. Number three, don't be shocked when the bills come. <laughs> Maybe you need to take a math class, but you knew it was coming. Can I get an amen? amen? And this is my favorite. Number one, number one, don't be shocked at this anymore. Don't be shocked when you say anything on Facebook. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you support or what you condemn or what you condone. Somebody going to be mad at you. Just build a bridge. And get over it. Can I get an amen in the house? I mean, we get shocked at all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, let me put number, I said there were four. Here's number five. Don't be surprised when difficult things happen. Don't be, especially in the context of this passage, if you stand up for Jesus and somebody smacks you down, if you put your faith out there and somebody makes fun of you, if you try and support somebody and they try and undercut you apologetically, don't be surprised. And it's not just a little thing. Go back to the passage. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial. Everybody say fiery. 
The word fiery is a unique Greek word that means intense pain, a searing pain. Now, we've all had pain, but when we say a searing pain, that means something, doesn't it? If the doctor asks you, is this, is this like a one, a three, a seven? You go, it's an 11. It's an 11. We all think it hurts more than it does, right? But if you've ever had a searing pain, you see, the language that Peter was using here would really reflect in the minds of the hearers and the readers. Because it was in this day and age that Christians were being dipped in tar, tied to poles, and lit on fire. They were considered so useless, they were used to light garden parties in the Roman Empire of the wealthy. They were burned at the stake in the public square. This language was don't be surprised. Don't, don't think it's strange when the fiery trials come your way. I thank God every day that we live in a country where the worst thing they can do is not like us. I thank God we live in a country every day that the worst thing they can do is say bad things about us, maybe even lie about us, maybe make things a little hard. So far, they haven't been able to drag us into the streets and tie us to anything. They haven't been able to kill us or even jail us. I thank God for that. But here's the deal. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, don't be surprised. You know what he told his disciples? The world hated me. They're probably not going to like you. That's a quote right out of the New Testament. Jesus said, they hated me, but they're not going to like you. Don't be surprised. Everybody say, don't be surprised. So what's on the flip side of that? You got to prepare. You have to prepare. Everybody say, you have to prepare. Now, for those of you who say, how do you prepare for all this? There's no way to prepare for every unknown. But when you know you're going to stick your neck out in this direction, you probably have a pretty good idea what you need to do. Some of you need to talk to your family and friends. I don't know how many times I've had the sit-down meeting with my boys and said, guys, I'm going to try this. I'm going to say this. Then this is probably going to come out. You're probably going to hear this at school. And, and, and all the time, it's always coming back. Some kid says, well, my dad says your dad's one of these. My dad says your dad. <laughs> there was a funny one this last week. I'm debating whether I should tell you. <laughs> okay, I will. It's probably wrong, but I'm going to anyway. My youngest son said they were studying in history about Mormons, and one of the kids piped off and says, well, Nathan's dad's a Mormon. <laughs> and my son had the greatest response ever. He's only got one wife. <laughs> I find that funny. Anyway, don't be surprised. If you need to prepare, if, if you're going to stick your neck out in Jesus' name, if you're going to take a risk that you think is a godly thing, if you're, and you know this may happen, this is in the realm of possibility, get ready. Get ready. Have the conversation. Be prepared. Pray about it. Study. Get your small group, your grow group behind you. Just be prepared and don't be surprised. And all God's people said? Amen. Second, not only should you prepare yourself for trials, if you're a Christian, everybody say, if you're a Christian... If you're a Christian, share the suffering with Jesus. Share the sufferings with Jesus. Now, most of us don't like this language, but if you read Paul, if you read Peter, if you read throughout the New Testament, the early saints considered it a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ. Now, nobody likes to suffer just to go through a medical thing, but, but if you're diagnosed with something and you walk through a treatment or you walk through some difficulty and loss and you can glorify Jesus in that, guess what? That is a privilege that no one would want, but it's a privilege you can make out of that dire situation. And maybe, maybe something else came upon you. Maybe somebody did you wrong, or they turned their back on you, or they betrayed you. And when that happened, you would never want that to happen. And it's not exactly happening because you were standing up for Jesus. But now in this place, you can forgive, you can move on, you can love. And in the middle of that, you can glorify Jesus in the middle of that mess. But especially, everybody say especially, especially. if you stand up for Jesus... If you put his name out there, if you take one for the team, then you can share in his sufferings. I have to go back to the passage. Go back to verse 13. But rejoice. That's a hard word. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. In other words, he's saying, I know you're suffering. It's not like you're going to do a happy dance. But insofar as you understand you're sharing in Christ's sufferings, rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. rejoice. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. 
Because the spirit of glory, everybody say glory. The spirit of glory and God rests upon. Did you see what that says? If you are insulted because of his name, then the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. That's amazing stuff. But to share, to share in his sufferings. What does it mean to share in his sufferings? Another word for share. We, we think of share as in share a, you know, a tweet. Share a thing. I'm gonna, oh, I'll share that and, and go out and, and then you let everybody else see what somebody else said. That's not what share means. Share means to participate in, to participate in. Our culture has got something weird going on because of uh, things like Netflix. We are now binge and uh, binge watchers of television series. Remember when you used to have to wait B before even VCRs? You remember that? Anybody remember before VCRs? All kids are going, VC what? <laughs> we'll explain it to you at dinner. Um, but before, you used to have to wait. You would know what time your show came on. And then you would go watch that show. It was a deal, right? I can't, be, I can't meet you Tuesday 7. No, my show's on. That's, that's the show that I watch. Somebody said, I can't meet you any day after 5 because <laughs> my shows are on. And, and you would go catch those shows. And, and we all have those favorite shows over the years. Some of you old enough, you remember MASH. Y'all remember MASH? The show that lasted longer than the war. You know what I'm talking about? It went on and on. And, and how many of you were fans of Friends? Anybody watch Friends? Yeah, yeah. And you hear that music, it just makes you happy, right? You know what I'm talking about? I, I, I watched those, but man, I was a big fan of Stargate Universe. Only had two seasons, and I thought it was a crime that they only had two seasons of that. One guy, that's it, me and you, we'll watch it together sometime. <laughs> I mean, I remember watching that last episode and being mad and writing letters. I, I wrote a letter, <laughs> a strongly worded email. <laughs> Upset. And the reason I bring all these up is when some of these shows end, when some of these series end, you can watch online, you can talk to people, people have vehement feelings about that, don't they? They're like, I can't believe they ended it that way. Or there's, there's just something missing in my life now that that's not on it. All right, so I, I'm going to watch them all again from front to back. I, I, I got to tell you something. They're not real. <laughs> and even if they were, you weren't there. Can I get an amen in the house? We get so invested in things that we watch. We get so connected to things that we see that we realize, what we forget to realize, we weren't even there. I mean, we, we like it and we appreciate it, but we never really participated in it. We think we shared in it because we saw it. But here's the invitation from Christ. Here's the invitation. Beyond reading the story, beyond hearing the sermon, beyond understanding the media, that when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have been given the privilege, the honor, the responsibility to participate and share in the sufferings of Christ. I don't know if right now you say, I don't know if I want in on that. Good. When you come to the place where you realize, this has meant so much to me, I'm willing to endure. This has been such a blessing to me that I will stand up and take my place. Then you've been given an opportunity for the spirit of glory and of God to rest upon you. And some of you are a little twisted right now because you've just heard, our, this is so countercultural. This is opposite of everything else you've ever been taught, everything else you've ever been able to pursue. You now have a guy who's standing in front of everybody saying that we, we, we should rejoice when we suffer, that we should embrace this as an opportunity. Everything I've ever been taught says that's lunacy. Yeah. Welcome to the gospel. It's not that we should run towards it, but that when it happens, we can embrace it and understand. Let, let, let me help you out with this. Acts 1.8. Jesus is already in resurrected form. He is standing on the hill before he ascends into the heavens. And do you know what he tells his disciples? He goes, and my spirit will come upon you and you will have great power and you will be my witnesses. Now that's a promise. That's a promise to our generation. This is what he said. That my spirit, now remember, this is before the Holy Spirit came, right? Now you have this. If you've asked Christ in your life, you have God's Holy Spirit in you. That the Spirit will come upon you and you will have great power and you will be my witnesses. 
Now, it's going to connect in just a minute. We're doing a little bit of Bible study. Back here in the passage, I had you repeat the word. The spirit of glory. Everybody say glory. If you look, if you have a study Bible with you, this is why you need to get a Bible. If you have a study Bible with you, they're going to find a little number or a letter next to the word glory right there. See a little number or letter? Some of you have that? And it tells you that there's another way to translate that word glory. This is a little bit difficult. Somebody in this room, shout it out. What, what word could you also put there? Power. The spirit of power. And you will receive my spirit and will have great power and you will be my witnesses. And when you suffer, the spirit of power and glory and the spirit of God will be. I'm still not making the connection. Let me help you out with this. Go back to Acts 1.8 where you will have great power. You know what it also says? You will be my witnesses. The word witnesses is pronounced in the Greek marturos. It's the word we get martyr from. In Jesus' own words, my spirit will come upon you and you will receive great power from me as you are martyrs in my name. And then what does Peter say? When you suffer as the martyr of Jesus Christ, when you take your lumps in Jesus' name, the spirit of power and the spirit of God will rest upon you. You want to know, have you ever seen those great stories? I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they endured. I don't know how they were able to stand that. Have you ever heard, you ever known somebody, your great grandma, she was an incredible woman of faith and she suffered. And, or this guy you knew at work that was amazing. He was giving God glory and all this. You know how they did that? The spirit of glory and power and the spirit of God is upon those who are willing to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. This is a tough place to be. I'm preaching this and let me tell you, you, you know whose booty's getting kicked first? Mine. Because these are words that no one wants to hear, but these are truth. These are truths and truism from God's word. And all God's people said. Now, I could camp out there, but I've got something else I need to share with you. The third thing, if you're a Christian, this is my favorite one. Here we go. Don't suffer from stupidity. I should have got an amen there. <laughs> don't suffer from stupidity. You say, I don't see that in the passage. Yes, you do. Let me take you back there. First Peter chapter 4. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Do y'all see what it says there? It says you can suffer in one of two ways. You can suffer because you did something stupid or you can suffer in that name. And what's that name? If you were in the verse before, if you were insulted because you used the name of Jesus, in that name, in that name. Everybody say, in that name. No, we all, we all like to think that our suffering is righteous. But let's just be straight up. A good chunk of our suffering is because we be stupid. Look at somebody near you and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> A good chunk of our suffering, and I love this list. If you don't see, sometimes we read Bible lists and we just think, well, they're all sins, but, but there's a direction. I want you to go back to this list in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. That's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, you're thinking, well, off the hook there, ain't killed nobody. Thief. Well, that's bad, but it's not as bad as a murderer. I'm not really, a th I mean, I've taken more than one when they say only take one ketchup packet, but is that really, is that stealing? I don't well, I didn't report all my income, but it kind of washes out in the mix. And I, I, Maybe I'm not a thief. I don't know. Or an evildoer. Well, I, I, I don't know. I'm not perfect, but am I an evildoer? Or as a meddler. Y'all be meddlers. <laughs> you may think you got off on some of those others, but everybody, everybody say everybody. Everybody in this room is meddling in somebody else's business. You've been, if you're on Facebook, you're meddling in somebody else's business. If you have a cell phone, you're meddling in somebody else's business. And so what that passage does is says, don't suffer because you did this, 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 or even this. So this is for everybody. Everybody say everybody. everybody. Don't suffer from your own stupidity. You know, here's the truth. Have you ever, have you ever seen those things? I love it when they, they say, if this person, this person had a baby and they use that, that, Terminal, they use that uh, software and then they show what a baby would look like if those two people came. That's so funny to me. I love doing that. I, I've often wondered if you and I got together with stupid, what would our baby look like? <laughs> you ever wondered? I, I came up with another list. Let me help you out with this. If you and the stupidity of bad planning got together, 
in that name. What does it say? You suffer in that name? You better put a name on that baby. If you and the stupidity of bad planning got together, do you know what you call that? Broke. Just call that baby broke. I'm broke. Oh, God, I'm suffering. You know why you're suffering? Because you are a bad planner. Now, sometimes, 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 it was a great cataclysmic alignment of the stars, and everything happened against you. But it's usually because you don't give up your data plan soon enough. Or you want too many tiers of cable. Or you eat out like 97 times a month. And your bad planning is a suffering that you're now going through. And name that baby. I name you broke. And that baby is named after your marriage with stupidity. Can I get an amen in the house? This isn't this fun for me. Might not be fun for you. Let's just say you and the stupid baby came from bad preparation. Not just bad planning, but bad preparation. Do you know what you name that child? Late. People all the time, late, late, late. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor, I couldn't be here. I'm sorry, I'm just 15 minutes late. I'm sorry. Hey, and they got this great long line of excuses on how the devil made them late. You know, I believe that it is possible for Satan to hinder you, but I, I don't think he's messing with your minivan. Sometimes we're just late because we did that. We're suffering because we were stupid. Can I get an amen in the house? I'm still going to go. You don't look like you're having fun, but I'm going to still do it. <laughs> How about this one? You and bad priorities get together. Well, name that baby. Waste. You and bad performance get together. You just didn't do it right. You just name that baby. Sin. See, there's a lot of times that we suffer for a righteous sake, but there's a whole lot of times we suffer because we're murderers, we're thieves, we're evildoers. We're meddlers. We just did something stupid. And God said, now here's the good news. Everybody say good news. Even if you started suffering because you did something stupid, when you put your stupid in the hands of God, this is good news for everybody, because some of you in here are really, really stupid. <laughs> it's just true. <laughs> that even when, when you put even your stupid in the hands of God, he can take that turn it into wisdom for your life and begin to glorify his name and you move from column A to column B and you are no longer suffering from stupidity. You can suffer for the cause of Christ. Isn't that good news? I wish I could go on. This passage could be a month's worth of teaching, but I got one more. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, let suffering produce trust. If you're a Christian, let your suffering produce trust. Let me go back. To, don't, don't you leave me. This is the most important thing I got to share with you. Last verse, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome of those be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely, scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust. Everybody say entrust entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Do you see it right there? Everybody's going to suffer. But when you suffer, it's an opportunity to learn trust. It's an opportunity to grow faith. It's an opportunity to become genuine. Now, I'm going to counterdict. I'm going to move in a different direction, something that's going to be a struggle. I'm not going to even ask you to believe it right now. I'm going to ask you to wrestle with it. Here's a statement that you've heard and you probably thought came out of the Bible, and I'm going to, I'm going to wrestle with this. I'm going to have you wrestle with this. God will never give you more than you can handle. That is not true. That is not in the Bible. And if you think, no, I got a verse. No, you don't. What you got is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which says something similar, but it does not say that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, here is, uh, here's what it says. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, what does that say? That says God will not let you be tempted beyond what you, but there is a difference between tempting and testing. In other words, I would agree if you say, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you, amen, that's right in the word, I understand that. If you say, God will not let you be tested beyond what, nope. You want to know why? 
is because I believe that God does allow us to be tested beyond what we can bear because he wants us to learn to trust him. Again and again, you look at these in the scriptures, they were tested beyond their own abilities. People say this all the time, oh, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can bear. Quit lying to them. God will allow them to receive more than they can bear, but God is saying in the middle of this, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He is a God who can be trusted. He is stronger than chariots and horses, that the God of the universe will meet you in that place. He will bear that burden with you, and he will lift it up, but it will crush you if you do not turn to him. I mean, this is huge. This is di- I want you to wrestle with this. If you read through Scripture, here's the problem. If we think, well, God won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, we can deal with that. God won't let you be tested beyond. Here's the problem. You start looking at people and you go, oh, they're just better man than I am. You could handle that. I couldn't handle that. Listen, there is no one righteous. No, not one before the God of the universe. There's no one in here. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody does. I, I want to I show you something real quick. Carl, can I ask you to come up here? I didn't ask him ahead of time. He's probably going to be mad at me for doing this. I, I brought something up here. Plastic bags. How many of you have a little thing in your kitchen full of plastic bags? Why do we save these? <laughs> they're not, come on over here. I appreciate you. What, to reuse them. We save them to reuse them. I need you to hold this for me. Because this plastic bag, just kind of hold it normal like that, this is going to represent a life, right? And I've used a plastic bag because they're pretty fragile, aren't they? Plastic bags. And um, the reason I have this is that I have overloaded plastic bags before. Anybody here before? So I, I brought a few things here to, to represent life. So I want you just to stand right there so everybody can see you. And let me try a few things here. First of all, does stuff ever break at your house? Car ever break? Sometimes, sometimes you got to put some stuff. Uh-oh. <laughs> you got to put some stuff in the back because stuff breaks. You ever get hungry? You ever get hungry and eat fast food when you know you should have done better? Like Pringles? Even if they are bacon flavored? Mm. <laughs> you, you ever feel like you're lost and, and you need some information? Don't you wish you had an instruction manual for relationships? Don't you wish you had that? Don't you wish you had a book on how to fix everything? And, and so you maybe do some reading or some research, right? Hmm. Is that bag getting heavy yet? Still, you're able to handle it. You're okay. Maybe uh, you're walking through life and and things get just a little bit difficult, right? And you're dehydrated. And this is a spiritual history. Times of dryness, whether it's in your relationship, in your walk, whatever it is. Uh Uh-oh. Well, maybe we're doing okay. But then you know what happens? The normal stuff of life happens. Then all of a sudden, an avalanche. Have you ever had this day? I mean, your bag's already full. And then, bit by bit, it just started. You had a text message before you woke up. And all of a sudden, the day starts happening. And all of a sudden. That's a good bag. (laughs) Hang on, brother. Oh. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? It's just a matter. Would you give Carl a hand? Thank you for coming up here. (laughs) I don't know why, but there's a pretzel in there. I didn't put that in there. Do do y'all feel what I'm getting at right here? That with all those pressures, all those weights, here's what you need to know. Your bag will break. So that's why you need the double bag triple bag. Maybe you need something better. You need to box that thing. You know what you need? You need to, in the middle of your crisis, when all the weight is coming on and that strap is starting to stretch and the bottom starting to buckle when it's all about to bust, that's when you go, oh, dear Jesus. Oh, my God. I got nothing left. Let me lean into you. Let me depend on you. Let me begin to trust you because my bag is going to break. And let suffering produce trust. There's a lot of lessons from what we looked at right here. But I think there's one for everybody. One more time, everybody say everybody. everybody. Whatever you've been through, whatever you're in, whatever you're going through, lean into him. Let that moment, if nothing else, 
even if everything stayed wrong and continued to hurt and was just bad from the outside. Let what happens on the inside in your own hearts honor Christ as Lord and learn to trust him. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. I thank you for the opportunity to share in the sufferings of your son. Now, we're honest. We don't want it. We don't desire it. We wish we could avoid it. But we consider it a privilege that we may suffer in your name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for those who are undergoing the suffering right now. Would you give us the ability to put it into your hands so that you can turn it into your glory? May the spirit of glory and power and the spirit of you, our God, rest upon those who are in suffering. And for each and every one of us, God, right now, there are those who are going through treatment medically. There are those who are going through a divorce, and it is devastating. There are those who are through heartbreak and, and disappointment and disillusionment, and everything seems to be falling apart. God, may these be the days that they learn how to rely upon and trust in you. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And all God's people said.